Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for our presentation titled Introduction to Film Fret for Screening Applications. It's my pleasure to introduce you today, Dr. David Andrews. Dr. Andrews is the Director of and Senior Scientist in Biological Sciences at Sunnybrook Research Institute and the Professor of Biochemistry and Medical Biophysics at University of Toronto and a Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Membrane Biogenesis. For a complete biography of our speaker, please visit the tab at the top of your screen. If any questions arise during the presentation, we encourage you to submit them through the Q&A box. Our speaker will address those questions following the end of the presentation. Please join me now in welcoming Dr. Andrews. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Welcome, sir. Well, thank you for the introduction and thank you for everyone who's come to listen to the presentation. A uh, more descriptive version of my title is really measuring protein-protein interactions in live cells using fluorescence lifetime imaging microscopy and Forster resonance energy transfer. And that's a real mouthful, which is why, of course, I used the shorter title. But uh, in the cell, there are two really main things that proteins do, enzymatic reactions and interactions. And most of the drugs that are available today target the enzymatic actions um, of the different proteins in the cell. But there's been recent success in targeting protein-protein interactions, particularly with a molecule I'm very familiar with, which is called venetoclax, which has turned out to be a blockbuster drug for chronic lymphocytic leukemia and is now being introduced into other leukemia-type diseases. And the pathway that it interacts with is what's shown here. And you can see from this pathway that there are many, many different proteins, some of which are enzymes, but many of these are regulated by protein-protein interactions, meaning that there are a plethora of targets, potential pharmaceutically relevant targets within the cell for which we have very little uh, in the way of drugs that have been designed because pharma in general considers these to be very hard targets. However, they are starting to fall. And so what's now needed uh, is ways to actually measure protein-protein interactions inside live cells. And so the interactions I'm going to talk to you about today are shown here, just a small section of that total graph describing programmed cell death mechanisms in cells. And the particular proteins I'm interested in are the BCL2 family of proteins, which regulate the commitment step in programmed cell death, the, the particular programmed cell death called apoptosis. This, this takes place at the outer mitochondrial membrane because the goal of a pro-apoptotic protein is to permeabilize that membrane. And the reason I'm using these for this particular talk today is because this is probably one of the most difficult examples of being able to measure protein-protein interactions in live cells because these proteins are targeted to the same subcellular compartment and to the membrane of that compartment. So collisions are a, a big influence on what would appear to be interactions. And many of the technologies that are used to look at proximity, proximity-based ligation assays or uh, bimolecular fluorescence complementation assays, so-called BIFC, uh, protein complementation with luciferase, all of those kinds of things are really proximity assays as opposed to actual binding assays. And the advantage of FLIMFRET as you will see today, is that it provides a way to actually measure binding interactions quantitatively in live cells. And now with recent developments at high enough speed that we can actually use this in early stage drug development. So I'm going to go through the underlying principles of FlimFret, explain why this is, in my view, an ideal way of measuring protein-protein interactions in live cells. 
talk to you about the advantages, but also some of the disadvantages of the technique. And one thing to keep in mind right from the beginning, a major disadvantage is false negatives. <clears throat> Whereas many of the other techniques, the problem is false positives. So in another sense, FlimFrat is a wonderful complementary tool to the proximity type-based assays because they have opposite uh, detractions and therefore if you get a positive with both, you're absolutely sure you're measuring a real protein-protein interaction in a cell. You're not going to need to know a lot about these proteins or memorize all the names. Um, we're going to use them relatively interchangeably. Uh, it, the important point here is that these are membrane proteins whose function is through protein-protein interactions. Okay, so we want to screen for protein-protein interactions in, in this particular forum, and that means that we need to be able to automate this and we need to be able to make it fast. So this is the underlying technique. Uh, at the moment, it requires fusion of the target and bait proteins to fluorescence proteins. Generally, these kinds of techniques are used all the time in cuvettes with purified proteins. In that case, you're using very low molecular weight dyes, and so there's very it's very infrequent that you have problems due to the labeling. Here, you have to be much more care, careful about the labeling because the fluorescence proteins can be as large or larger than your bait and prey. In this particular case, they're roughly the same size. So here I'm illustrating the interaction of BCLXL, an anti-apoptotic protein that prevents cell death, with one of the BH3 proteins. And there's a bunch of different BH3 proteins that all bind to BCLXL. And the net result of that is that both proteins are anchored to the membrane and both proteins are inactivated by this interaction. So we refer to this as mutual sequestration. And so it's very important to be able to measure the amount of monomers and complexes and where they are in the cell to be able to understand how a cell is going to respond, for example, to chemotherapy, and also how it's going to respond to drugs designed to separate those two protein-protein interactions. Okay, so what is FRET? FRET is Fluorescence Resonance Energy Transfer, and it's based on illuminating a fluorophore, and when you illuminate that fluorophore, two things happen. One that we're all familiar with is that a uh, light that's absorbed by the fluorophore will be re-emitted at a longer wavelength due to a loss of energy in the fluorescent state. And that's the basis of all our fluorescence microscopes. The other thing that we don't often think about is that there's a time delay between the excitation with the blue light and the emission here of the green light. And that time delay, uh, there's some structural rearrangements in the fluorophore as some vibrational things, and that's where some of the energy is lost and why the wavelength is longer. But that delay time is the fluorescence lifetime, and that's what we're going to use to measure energy transfer in a microscope as opposed to a cuvette. So here we have the emission um, wavelengths from this fluorophore uh, when it's excited by the blue light. I've got a green emission. And what's required for energy transfer is that you have another fluorophore and this fluorophore has to be very, very close. The furthest you can detect any kind of energy transfer event is 100 angstroms, but really at 50, it's gotten very weak. And that's because the energy transfer probability goes down with the 10 to the minus six. So you're taking distance and dividing it by 10 to the minus six to get the amount of energy that's uh, transferred. So this, this becomes a really good molecular ruler for distances between 10 and 50 angstroms, i.e. real binding. Now that other fluorophore has to have a um, excitation spectrum that overlaps the emission spectrum of the donor for you to get energy transfer. 
And when you do get energy transfer, one of the things that you then see is a decrease in the emission of the donor and an increase in the uh, fluorescence from the acceptor because some of that energy is transferred. Often people think that the green light is exciting the red fluorophore. That's not the case. F fluorescence resonance energy transfer is non-radiative transfer of energy, which is why they really have to be so close together. And there are multiple things that can affect the fluorescence emissions of both molecules. In a cuvette, you're good to go if you measure the loss of emission from the donor. It's much more difficult to measure quantitatively the stimulated emission of the acceptor. And in a microscope, this is really problematic because the underlying assumption for calculating energy transfer is that you know the relative concentration of the donor and the acceptor. Not in the population of cells, not in the cell, not in the mitochondria or some membrane of the cell, but in every pixel of the image. You have to know the relative concentration of donor and acceptor. So if you're using a sensor where the two are genetically linked, you're okay. Otherwise, it's really impossible to use quantitatively despite what the microscope companies will tell you about their microscopes. Okay, so how does this then work and how do we use lifetime to get uh, a measurement of fluorescence resonance energy transfer or FRET? So what happens when the uh, fluorophore goes into an excited state, here its fluorescence lifetime is 2.8 nanoseconds, and then you get a decay curve. And that's because they don't all decay at exactly 2.8 nanoseconds. They decay with all kinds of different lifetimes. It's a stochastic process. Remember I said they wobble around, they lose a little bit of energy, uh, and, and then they emit a photon. So you really need to collect this curve, which is different times after excitation that photon is emitted so that you can measure the uh, lifetime. And by convention, that's the fluorescence divided by E, so not quite a half. Uh, and that time that it takes for fluorescence divided by E is then tau zero, or the fluorescence lifetime of the donor by itself. When you have a donor and an acceptor, and they're actually close enough to each other to get energy transfer, that tau decreases. And the reason it decreases is that the energy transfer event is more probable the longer time goes on that the two fluorophores are in close proximity. So that means you preferentially lose the ones that would take a long time to decay. And so the decay curve changes shape and looks like this. So when you have a fret, uh, tau fret here, now you see that the A naught divided by E is uh, much smaller uh, in terms of time after excitation because you preferentially lost the ones with a longer lifetime. So if we can measure tau zero or uh, yeah, tau zero and tau fluorescence or tau fret, then we can uh, be able to get an estimate of the number of molecules that are bound to each other, uh, giving us the shorter lifetime. Now, this is in theory, right? In practice, uh, when you try and do this, the instruments are not perfect. And so there's also an instrument response time that's involved. So what you're doing is you're pulsing the laser, and that's shown by those two little blue triangles with the pulsed laser. So you send out a pulse of the laser, and when you do that, you start a stopwatch. And then that pulse goes through the scanning confocal, it hits the specimen, and then after a period of time, uh, usually a few nanoseconds, the uh, photons get returned. And what you're doing then is taking those photons that come back to a time-correlated single photon counting device. And essentially what you're doing is measuring the time it took from when you started the stopwatch till the arrival of the first photon, and then you stop your stopwatch. And you have to do that a whole bunch of times to be able to build up this decay curve that you see in red. And the reason it doesn't look like those theoretical ones is because the instrument response time 
that has to be deconvoluted from this. So you have that lag at the beginning because the machines are just not fast enough. Remember that this is happening in a very short time, right? About uh, two to four nanoseconds. And you, to get a, a good representation of that curve, you need about a thousand photons back. And you don't want to get a, a photon every time you flash the laser, or you'd get two sometimes. So that means you have to flash more than a thousand times, which means that we end up flashing the laser 40,000 to 80,000 times a second and starting and stopping the stopwatch 40 to 80,000 times a second to be able to record this data. So when the salesperson tells you it's going to cost you a fair bit, now you know why, because this is a pretty uh, difficult thing to measure. And uh, to do this in screening mode, uh, you'll see is even more complicated. Nevertheless, the principle is actually really simple. You have your Venus BCLXL here and your VH3 protein, whichever one that is. The Venus alone is 2.8 nanoseconds. There's no fret. When you've got uh, fluorophore emitting at 2.3 nanoseconds, then the BH3 protein is bound to BCLXL. So th that's, that's the whole principle behind the thing. Then in practice, how are you going to use that information? Uh, what I'm illustrating here is one image area. So this is essentially one pixel. So that blue is the laser that's exciting one spot on the mitochondrial membrane. And within that spot, you'll see that there's three BCLX cells, all with a Venus. There's no binding partner in this uh, pixel of the image. So the lifetime of the Venus is 2.8 nanoseconds. If we now introduce the binding partner, typically by transient transfection, then this decay curve that we see here, centered around 2.8 nanoseconds, is going to shift. And it shifts when you have a single uh, m cherry BH3 protein in this particular case. Now in this pixel, you have one at 2.3, and two at 2.8. So the lifetime is actually around 2.7, right? Because you've got 2.8 plus 2.8 plus 2.3 divided by three. And so what you need to do then is to get lots of different pixels that have increasing amounts of m cherry in them now you see that the lifetime drops to 2.43 nanoseconds. And when we finally saturate, we have to have a lot of excess to be able to saturate. Then you finally get down to 2.3 nanoseconds. So that means that by using a transient transfection and lots of different cells or areas of cells with different amounts of your acceptor, you get the information that you need to get a binding curve. So what does this look like? Here's some representative data. Uh, this is when we were first getting going in this kind of thing. And you'll see here cells, uh, we typically have the donor uh, stably expressed. So this is a cell line, these are MCF7 cells uh, expressing Venus BCLXL. And then uh, below that, where you have M cherry bad, that's a transient transfection uh, into those cells of the M cherry bad. And the computer automatically finds regions of interest within those cells. As is typical in screening applications, you automatically reject cells that have hit the edge of the detection area. So the three cells at the bottom are excluded. And uh, we are left with three cells that we can analyze. Cells one and two, there's a high expression of the M cherry bad. And cell three, there's very little, if any, uh, M cherry bad. So when you then measure the uh, intensity weighted fret flim or flim fret, uh, the red there is the M cherry, uh, and that is because of the change in lifetime, right? So the lifetime is illustrated on the graph below, which goes from red to white to blue. So in a cell that's not expressing any uh, BH3 protein, that's cell number three, you have that uh, photon histogram that's blue and colored blue in the intensity weighted image. So that's where you have no fret. Then in the other peak underneath the red cells, 
that's the two red cells where you are expressing the mCherry bad and it's binding to BCLXL and the lifetime has changed. The area under the curve of each of those two peaks is just the number of pixels. So that's actually not relevant to uh, measuring the phlegm fret. What's relevant there is the distance between those two peaks because that distance between the two peaks is the change in lifetime and that's a concentration independent measure of the energy transfer. So how tightly the proteins are bound to each other. And, and so it's the distance between the peaks that we measure in order to determine how tight the binding is. And if you collect lots of this data, and that's what's shown here now, this is real data, but repositioned. So each of these cells is colored by the extent to which there is a phlegm fret interaction within them, uh, with red uh, being quite low or none, uh, up to blue where you've got about a 15% phlegm fret efficiency. And so you can see that you get all of the information that you need for a binding curve, particularly when you use um, a transient transfection for the acceptor, because then the acceptor is present at different concentrations in different cells. And so you can get everything you need to generate a binding curve. Now, this is a nice illustration of how you end up with the binding curve, but what does the data really look like shown here? And uh, this is the same experiment. Uh, this is now m cerulean 3 to Venus, so a different donor acceptor pair. Uh, when we first started doing these experiments, m cerulean 3 didn't exist. Uh, it's a much better pair uh, because you have a, a longer lifetime for m cerulean 3 so the dynamic range is greater. So the rest of my talk, I'll be using cerulean to Venus, where cerulean is the donor. And you can see there the regions of interest that are outlined in yellow automatically by the computer. And uh, in the venous channel, you can see that not all cells are expressing venous and those that are are expressing venous at different levels. And I've provided blow ups below uh, each of those the, of the little area in the box. And over then on the right, uh, you see the raw data. And to get a good curve, which is shown here, that's uh, about 5,000 measurements. So that big pile of data looks noisier than it really is because there's so much of it. Um, but if you look at the little red points along that graph, those are actually the averages within those windows that are set by the dotted lines. And the fit to a Hill equation for generating binding constants of all of that data is given by that blue line and the width of the blue line is the 95% confidence interval for the best fit of the data. So you actually get quite a nice binding curve out of this, even though on the uh, y-axis you're using the ratio of venous to cerulean 3, which is suboptimal. We really want to know the bound fraction and the concentration. So on the, the y-axis we have the phlegm fret efficiency, and on the x-axis the ratio of venous to cerulean 3 and that gives us a pretty good uh, simulation for a binding curve. The Hill coefficients are not right because we don't have uh, actual concentrations. And I'll show you how we get actual concentrations later. But this is the uh, quickest way to generate uh, a useful binding curve. And I say the quickest on a standard microscope, 5,000 measurements, 10 seconds each. And that's 14 hours for every curve. So. Um, this is not screening and it's not a great way to measure drug efficiency uh, because to measure drug efficacy, what we wanna do is have a drug that mimics this binding site. And that's what's shown in C there, the H2 and H4 positions, that yellow thing that you can see there is uh, a drug called ABT263 or Naviticlax, and it mimics the binding site for on BCL2 and BCLXL for the BH3 proteins. And so that's gonna displace this interaction and change that curve. And when we do that, you see here, ABT263 displaces BAD and BID, but not BIM from BCLXL. And this was the first actually real surprise. So if we go through this data from left to right, we'll start with BAD. And in the um, 
green line, you have the control, which is the uh, venous bad being expressed, and the cells are treated with DMSO instead of drug. Uh, to see that the DMSO isn't changing anything. There's the black line, which is just the venous fusion protein, and you can see that those two curves overlap. We have a control where we make a genetic mutation in the BH3 protein uh, that reduces binding. Uh, it's those two residues that the drug is meant to uh, copy. So it's BH3-2A because the two residues have been changed to alanine, and you can see for bad that that really reduces binding and you get a, a curve that's completely different. That's actually mostly collisions because it, there's a lag phase, but then it's just a straight line. And the probability of colliding goes up with concentration. So you can tell the difference between real binding and collisions by the shape of the curve. The blue one is the effect of ABT263. And so you, what you see there is that the drug is kicking bad off of BCLXL, not completely because it doesn't, it doesn't go uh, on top of the red line, but sufficiently that uh, you can see that the blue line is truncated pretty early, and that's because you now have enough bad kicked off BCLXL that the cell is dying. And the, you get exactly the same results with VTBID uh, in the next panel where now the blue line actually isn't even closer to the red line. So we can conclude from this that ABT263 displaces TBID from BCLXL better than it displaces BAD. But you'll see in the last panel with VIMB, Venus BIM EL that there's no displacement. There's no displacement by the mutation or by the drug. And I said this was surprising. Why is it surprising? Well, because if you use uh, purified pieces of the proteins without the membrane binding domains, then this is not the result that you get. In uh, SPR or other biophysical assays using the purified proteins and peptides and pieces of proteins, all of these experiments, BIM is displaced equivalently to bad BID from BCLXL. But in a living cell, that doesn't happen. To cut a long story short, a story I'm not going to sell, I'm not going to talk about today. Uh, we were eventually able to identify that there's a second binding site in BIMEL that people were cutting off because it's within the membrane binding region of BIM, and it's that second binding site that's making the complex resistant to the drug. So here's a result that was completely unobtainable using conventional approaches used in pharma and drug discovery, but by measuring the interactions in a living cell, you find out that the drugs don't work exactly the way you thought they did. So there's, there's value here, but remember that each of these curves took 14 hours to generate. It's not exactly screening, right? So how are we going to get to screening? Well, the way we did that was to build a new machine. Uh, and that's a machine that will measure fluorescence lifetimes and intensities rapidly. And this is the instrument that we built here. I'm going to take you through how it works and what it is that you, we needed to do to make screening possible. And I will tell you as well that uh, similar machines, not, not this one, but uh, similar machines are now commercially available. So it is possible to, for any of you uh, to do this uh, in a screening type mode, uh, you'll need to make some software changes that the companies have not anticipated, but the hardware is now available. So I assume that the software will come along as well. Okay, so what do we, what do we have to do? How does it work? How do we get it faster? Well, we made two changes. We put in a hyperspectral detector that allows us to detect all the different wavelengths as we need to be able to measure the concentrations of the donor and acceptor. And then we still need a measure of their interaction, which is concentration independent. So we're still using time correlated single photon counting. But if you look in the bottom left hand corner, you'll see that the detection system has many more detectors. So we've built in eight parallel detectors uh, using 
D-shaped mirrors to carve off some of the photon beam to each of the detectors. Now, to give you a little perspective on this and uh, just how fast these measurements are, each one of these avalanche photodiodes uh, is uh, about the size of a, a fat cell phone, a little, little bit thicker than a normal cell phone and a, a, a rel relatively small smartphone. And they're spaced only a few millimeters apart. And we have to account for the length of time it takes light to move from one detector to the next to be able to make these measurements correctly. So we need to know how long it takes light to go about three inches and account for that when we, when we uh, correct for the time. Fortunately, in, in any commercial instrument, they do that for you. But just, just to give you an idea what's going on. And then uh, in addition to that, we have our hyperspectral detector. Uh, and you'll see why we need that on the next slide. But essentially, what we need to be able to do is to use the intensity of the two floor fours to get concentration. And the, the way we do that is to do standard curves, the same way you would in any biochemistry experiment. The trick here, not invented by me, but by Paul French uh, in England, is that at time zero, the time correlated single photon counting, at time zero, the probability of an energy transfer event is also almost zero. So you can use the time zero photons. So set your counter to count the time zero photons. Uh, and those are proportional to concentration. And you can see that here where we do a concentration response curve uh, where you have the concentration of M cerulean 3 on the Y axis and that counts on the X axis and you get a nice straight line. Using the hyperspectral detector, we can account for any bleed through from the cerulean into the venous channel uh, and uh, be able to measure the venous intensity. Uh, this is not affected so much by the energy transfer uh, because of the hyperspectral separation. And so again, we can get a nice straight line for the venous concentration, uh, which is independent of the energy transfer. So now we have everything we need. We have our two protein concentrations, and we have the FRET data, which will give us the bound fraction. So now we can actually get a KD and measure that in a live cell. So what did we need to do next? One more innovation. We need to have intelligent selection of ROIs. So what I'm showing you here is an image, and then the regions of interest for that image are illustrated in that sort of rust color next to that, next to the uh, intensity image. And the normal way that you do uh, ROIs and you can collect enough photons so that you have a good signal-to-noise ratio is to just bin. And all of you are familiar with binning on your microscope. So in here, we've got a three by three bin. Uh, it's used as a kernel, which means it moves one pixel across the image and averages the nine pixels in that square at each point. And th this is absolutely conventional way of binning the data so that you get good counting statistics. The problem with it, as you can see there, is that most of those X's are not on the gray object in the image. And so you're not measuring the um, a single environment. You're not measuring where the binding interaction is taking place. You're measuring leftover protein that's in the cytoplasm that's not involved in binding. And so your answer is quite complicated. This is very inefficient. It's also slow to calculate. Uh, so we've replaced that now with a intelligent way of binning where we seed on bright spots and then use a watershed algorithm out to accumulate enough pixels to get good counting statistics. It means that each rate region of interest is small. It then defines your resolution limit. Uh, a downside to this is that they're not all the same size. Areas of the cell where the uh, signal is low will be at lower resolution than areas where the signal is high. But that's a compromise that's pretty easy to live with because the resolution is still much better than you get with 
a square mini. So once we've done that, then we can take all those little ROIs and we can plot them on a graph. And here you see uh, one of those graphs. For some reason, part of it is missing. That's too bad. Uh, but you can believe me over at the uh, axis that the points go down to zero. And again, most of those points then fit on a nice binding curve. We still have points down near the bottom uh, that are stray points that look like they've fallen from the cloud up above. Those are still small areas of cytoplasm that we're measuring where there is no binding partner. Um, and, and so the, this way of selecting ROIs has improved the data a lot, but it's not uh, a complete solution. We're working on a, a complete solution now. Anyway, you get nice binding curves. So here's the data, the average data, uh, and now we're using only a single well, uh, much fewer images, and the blue is the binding of bad to BCLXL. You see a very nice binding curve. Uh, the mutation I showed you before, where you make a mutation in bad, we've made a more dramatic mutation to get rid of the residual binding that was still there. And so the gray line at the bottom is nice and straight, and that's collisions in the mitochondrial membrane. And then you have the red one, uh, which is now the effect of a BCLXL inhibitor, A1331852. It's a nice mouthful. Um, but now you can see that that BCLXL inhibitor is quite effective because it essentially reduces the curve to almost completely to collisions. There's still a little bit of a binding curve there, but uh, most of the uh, bad has been displaced off BCLXL by this this drug. So now we can get curves that now notice the axes are different. On the bottom, we have a free venous in micromolar, and on the uh, y-axis, we have bound fraction. So that means we, we're actually able now to measure a real KD in cells. Okay, so we've gotten here. What are we going to do with this? What, what are we going to use it for? And to explain in, in this particular case what we did with it, and it's a good example because it tells you the kind of use that you can make of this in any system. So any protein-protein interaction system that you might be working with, uh, you can now use in, in the way that I'm going to describe for the BCL2 family proteins. But it does mean that I'm going to have to introduce you to more BH3 proteins, not just bad and more anti-apoptotic proteins, not BCLXL, but it's really the BH3 proteins that there's a lot of. So we need to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly in terms of BH3 proteins and BH3 mimetics. I have to tell you a little bit about how the system works. So how does it work? Here's a diagram of the outer mitochondrial membrane. On this, I have the anti-apoptotic proteins in that sort of purple color. And they're BCLXL, BCL2, MCL1, and BCLW. There are the pore formers right beside them that are in the sort of greenish color, backs and back. We're not going to worry about those today at all. Uh, what we want to worry about are the BH3 proteins, and they come in two colors, the cyan color, BAD and NOXA, and the red color, uh, BID and BIM. The important thing about that distinction is that the activator ones can bind to BAX and BAC, as well as binding to BCL2 and BCLXL, whereas the uh, cyan ones, the sensitizer BH3s, bind only to the anti-apoptotic proteins. Why am I telling you all this? Because when you now start to measure KDs in live cells, the advantage and disadvantage of the approach all at once is that uh, you are measuring all of these interactions, the effect of all of these different interactions on the specific interaction that you're interested in. So the fact that the activators will bind to your protein of interest, say it's the venous BCLXL or cerulean BCLXL, uh, it'll also bind to BACs, and that's a competing side reaction that ends up being accommodated into your binding curve. So while the KDs are not biochemically pure, uh, they're much more reflective of what's actually happening in the cell. 
So I think this is actually a real advantage to the front flow approach. The other thing we have to talk about is the BH3 mimetics, and they work by binding to the anti-apoptotic proteins. Most people think of it as they just bind and inhibit, but that's not correct. Uh, these are competitive inhibitors, so you have yet another binding constant here. And so you're trying to swamp out the binding of a sensitizer and activator to the anti apoptotic protein using a drug that's a BH3 mimetic. And what we want to do is to measure the effectiveness of BH3 mimetics as these march through to the clinic because they're on their way. The Neticlax has already turned the corner and, and has been a spectacular success for chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So we want to be able to measure the different BH3 mimetic drugs in live cells and then be able to compare them to each other, one nice thing. And the other thing is to actually be able to ask, are they doing exactly what they're designed to do? We already saw with ABT263 that it does not displace BIM from BCLXL, even though it was originally designed to do so. Okay, so let's look at some data. So here's measuring uh, the dissociation constants now. And we're back to that same graph that I showed you before. We have the nice, nice binding curve for BCLXL and that. You have your equilibrium down below of donor to acceptor, uh, and you're measuring that KD. And the BH3 proteins that we're looking at here are BAD, BIM, BID, PUMA, BIC, and NOXA. In each case, there's a BH3-4E mutation, that's four glutamic acids that prevents binding or reduces binding. And so now we can actually talk about real KDs. A new wrinkle. So the KDs that you see there, BAD, BIM, BID, PUMA, BIC, they're all three or four microvolar. And we know that they're not. We know that they're actually less than that. Uh, so what's going on? Well, when you overexpress proteins in the cell, the other caveat to this whole approach is that you need to overexpress proteins in the cell. The local concentration at the mitochondria can be very high uh, because you, you're doing the overexpression. If the concentration is above the KD, then the KD that you measure is half the concentration that's expressed at that location. So that's why we're getting micromolar KDs for those NOXA. Uh, NOXA's K, where uh, the expression is actually below the KD. Uh, and so uh, that's a real KD for NOXA, eight micromolar. So it binds to BCLXL, but it binds very poorly. And then the red, you can see that the um, mutation has shifted the KD to something that's just impossible to achieve in cells. So you would not get binding in cells except maybe for TBID. Okay, so now we can get KDs. Uh, we can measure the effect on that apparent KD, even though it's not the real biochemical KD. We can measure the effect of that KD of uh, a mutation or a drug, which is our, our goal. So now we can do an experiment, an actual screening experiment. So here's the screen. BCLXL, BCL2, MCL1, and BCLW the four major anti-apoptotic proteins in cells. They're BH3 binding partners, BAD, BIM, BID, PUMA, BIC, and NOXA. So we're going to measure the binding of all of the BH3 proteins to each of the anti-apoptotic proteins. And then we're going to displace that with one of the drugs that's listed in the table. Uh, and the target for each of those drugs, the published target for each of those drugs is listed beside it. We need 1,800 measurements per combination to get nice binding curves. There's 360 combinations, so we need to make 650,000 measurements per experiment. And of course, we want to do this three times. So now you see why you need a screening instrument, even to do uh, a secondary screen on uh, compounds that you're already pretty sure of. You've got to generate and collect a lot of data. What's it look like? Here we are, we finally got there. 
Uh, we have a bunch of inhibitors uh, that we're testing here. They're listed down the left-hand side. Across the top, we have the different BH3 proteins. This one, as is labeled, is BCL2 as the target. So we're looking at displacement of bad BIM, BID, Puma, Bacon, Noxa from BCL2 by each of the drugs that's listed down the left. Displacement is red, uh, so red is dead, uh, and blue is lack of displacement. So the table actually becomes, although complicated, uh, very easy to read quite quickly. And you remember from before our positive control, ABT263, which is the second from the top, uh, you can see that at uh, 10 micromolar, you're getting of, of the compound, you're getting a KD of 10 micromolar for the interaction. Uh, so you're getting displacement because the concentration in the cell is only around three micromolar. So um, that, that's a compound that is actually displacing. So you don't have to be red, even yellow is, is already working. So, and, and that as I've shown you the data for that already. So that's ABT263 and BAD. We already looked at 263 and BIM. And again, you see that there's no displacement. Those are all blue. For TBID, you do see displacement. For Puma, a new surprise, no displacement of Puma, even though uh, that everyone, you know, the marketing people would tell you that it does. No displacement of BIC and very efficient displacement of NOXA, but that's because NOXA barely binds to BCL2 anyway. The other drugs there, AT101, 2-methoxyantamycin, BM1074, they don't do anything. They, they don't displace any of these, barely even displace a little bit of NOXA. So they, they're really non-functional in living cells. AZD4320, an AstraZeneca compound, uh, works very well for BAD. Works for BIM, not great. There's an error in the data there, as you might expect when you're doing screening. Uh, just the one error between 11 and 12. Uh, for TBID, it works well. But look again, Puma, nothing. No displacement of Puma. BIC is displaced, NOx is displaced. With ABT199, which is the absolutely killer uh, BCL2 inhibitor, you can see that most of the cells are red, so you're getting displacement. There's variations in color there. I don't have time to talk about that today, uh, but the problem or the wrinkle or the complication, however you want to think about it, is that ABT199 is itself fluorescent and undergoes energy transfer with the cerulean. So you're exchanging one fret for a different fret. Uh, and the calculations become very complicated. So we're still working on sorting that out. The next one is a, yes, uh, Serono, I think it is, a company. I can't remember. Anyway, another company, uh, BCL2, BCLXL inhibitor, and uh, it works for BAD, doesn't work for BIM, works for BID, doesn't work for Puma, uh, works a bit for BIC, and of course, Noxon. Okay, now, you know, maybe this is just my imagination, but when we go forward and we test BCLXL, we see that there are dramatic differences. So it's not just my imagination. Uh, you can see that our positive control, ABT263, still works for bad bid and for BIC. Uh, you can see that the AstraZeneca compound, uh, which is supposed to be specific for BCL2, is also hitting BCLXL. Not as much, but it is. It displaces bad. Uh, uniquely, it displaces BIM, which we have not seen, we had not seen before. It displaces BID, doesn't touch Puma, does displace BIC. Uh, A331852, I introduced you to earlier. This is, was originally discovered by the Wehi, it's now an Abbott uh, compound, and it's absolutely astounding, even at low micromolar, uh, low, actually low nanomolar. It displaces BAD, BIM, BID, all of them, uh, even Puma, the only drug that displaces Puma from anything, and BIC. 
And uh, then the S557746, there's also some displacement, but uh, in this case, uh, it's BID that's not displaced. So that's a surprise because normally BID is relatively easily displaced. And NOXA, part of the reason I'm showing you this is that we have a problem with NOXA. And the problem there is that there's built into the software automatically, uh, if the data doesn't generate a good curve, uh, it won't give you a KD. Uh, it instead gives you these symbols that says that the, the binding is too low or there's too much noise and whatever, it can't fit a binding curve, which means that we can resort to the original way we, that we used to do this, just just calculating resistance, uh, which is essentially, you know, what's the bound fraction uh, in the absence of drug, and then you're subtracting the bound fraction in the presence of drug and looking for that difference. And when you do that, the results that you get for NOXA are exactly what you would expect. Uh, the BCLXL inhibitors displace NOXA and the MCL1 inhibitors don't. So uh, the, the result is, is biologically what you would expect. So there is a way around it when the data is very noisy, um, but you always hope for better data. Hey, okay. now BCLW. The reason I wanna show you BCLW is uh, a little bit of a surprise. First of all, nobody knows how any of these compounds work on PCLW because there's no published data for it. So we're seeing here that uh, ABT263 uh, works for bad and not much else. The AstraZeneca compound uh, works for bad uh, and maybe not really for BIM, but a bit and works for BID, Puma, and PIC. And uh, this super amazing BCLXL inhibitor, A1331852, also displaces bad, bid, and a little bit thick from BCLW. And here's the surprise part, because I gave this talk uh, a few weeks ago uh, not knowing this particular answer, and somebody who was involved in the discovery of this drug put up their hand in the chat box and uh, told us all that uh, the drug was originally screened for for displacing uh, bad from BCLW, and they then tried to remove that activity uh, to make it BCLXL specific, but the original screen was against BCLW. And that probably explains why there's still some residual activity for BCLW, even though there's no activity cl 2 So that was pretty gratifying that, that uh, we had found something unexpected, but also sensible. Okay, so this is a lot, I know, to take in. And so what I want to do is just summarize what we learned from all this, because what can you learn from all this? Why, why do you do all this? So what did we learn? First of all, we learned that a lot of the inhibitors of our PH3 memetics that are for sale are not. So, you know, despite their claimed potencies, specificities, uh, they don't work in live cells. And so they're illustrated here in yellow. The other is that there's a bunch of others that whose specificity uh, is not what is claimed in the literature also. Uh, so that's leaving us actually not very many that actually do exactly what you think they do. So that's, that's an easy take home message. But we actually learned a lot more than that. If we come back here, one of the things we learned was that NOXA binds to BCL2, BCLXL, and BCLW, but with low affinity. The published literature says it just binds to MCL1. Is so that something new? I've just shown you none of the BH3 memetics work exactly as specified. Maybe a couple of the MCL1 ones, but none of the ones for proteins we looked at today. None of the BH3 memetics inhibits coma binding BCL2, BCLXL, and BCLW. The AstraZeneca one, Puma to XL a bit, but oh, not AstraZeneca, the Abbott one. Uh, but in general, it doesn't work. And that's totally new. Uh, only AstraZeneca's AZ4320 inhibits BIM binding to BCL2, BCLXL, and BCLW, which is really different than the other drugs. Uh, this one here, AbbVie's uh, drug that we just talked about, definitely the world's best inhibitor of BCLXL, 
but it also inhibits BCLW binding to bad and bid. AstraZeneca's AZD4320 inhibits BCL2 uh, and BCLXL as advertised, but also BCLW. And uh, since we're on it with Servier, Servier's BCL2 inhibitor S55746 inhibits BCL2 binding to bad bid oxa, not BIM or Puma. Uh, and it's supposed to be specific for BCL2, but it's not. It inhibits BCLXL by bad BIM. So we actually learned an awful lot. Uh, a lot of that may not be all that relevant to you, but the reason I went through it all is to say that with this uh, ability to be able to measure binding constants in live cells, we were able to generate a huge amount of new information about all of these drugs, which are marching through clinical trials and towards patients that you couldn't learn any other way. And so for all of you who may now or in the future be looking at a protein-protein interaction in a live cell, I think that uh, FlimFret is, is a, has the opportunity to provide you with a lot of information that you really can't get any other way. So, and last but not least, loss of BH3 memetics do not inhibit anything. So uh, be careful when you spend your money uh, because lots of them don't work. All that's left now is for me to thank the people who worked on this in my lab. Most of the work that you saw, saw on the big screen was Elizabeth Osterland, a PhD student in the lab. Chin Fang is a joint student. With, uh, Chin Fang is my collaborator on the engineering part and Nihad Hermes is a joint student with uh, Chin Fang. And there's lots of people in the lab that have uh, put some time into this, but particularly Shen Liu, Adrian Nukered, and James Pemberton. And thank you all for listening. Thank you very much. I'm ready to take questions. And thank you, Dr. Andrew, for that outstanding presentation. We do not have time for a Q&A this oh. afternoon, but we want to encourage our audience members to please submit their questions and questions we didn't have time today, we will address them via email. Dr. Andrews, however, I wanna offer you some time for closing remarks. Would you like to say anything to the audience before we close? I don't, I don't even know. <laughs> Am I even on? You are. Okay. Well, uh, thank you for uh, listening and participating. I'm sorry that some of the slides don't present properly. Uh, we'll get that fixed when we post it for on-demand watching. And, and thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. And thank you again, Dr. Andrews, and thank you to the audience for your participation. This presentation will be available for on-demand viewing in the SBI2 virtual conference for 12 months. And please remember to share it with your colleagues who may have been interested in today's topic. And don't miss out on the other presentations on our agenda. Thank you again for your participation. Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, take care. Bye-bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.